Welcome to the Asian Tapestry. Chapter 2 How to Salmon and the Frog Who Saved His Life Hello and welcome to the Asian Tapestry a podcast about myths, legends, and lore from Asia, structured in a book-like format called The Book of Fables. Chapter 1 of The Book of Fables was an animal tale revolving around a tiger, a jackal, and a brahmin. Chapter 2 is called Harasabhan and the Frog Who Saved His Life, a second fable from India. Within, you will find the gullible king, a fortunate man, and a fine frog who holds our hero's fate within his small, soft hands. There was once a very poor man called Harasamin. Harasamin had a wife and many, many children. This, of course, meant that there were many, many hungry bellies. Being of little talent and skill, Harasamin travelled from city to city with his family, begging on the streets, and this way managed to keep his family going. Eventually he reached a certain city, and managed, to his great surprise, and that of his wife's, to find employment in the wealthy household of a man called Stuladatta. Harasaman became an attendant, his wife a servant in the household, and his sons looked after the magnificent cows belonging to the house. As the days went by, Harasaman contented himself with a steady income, even if it was only just enough to feed his family. Then, some months later, it was announced that one of the daughters of Stuladatta was to be married and a grand wedding was to take place. At this news, Harasaman rejoiced, for he was sure that his patron would invite him and his family to dine with them on all kinds of delicacies. But as Harasaman, his wife, and their children watched plates and plates of food come out of the kitchen and pass right over their heads, they realized that they were never going to be served any food. In fact, their patron did not even acknowledge their presence. He was too busy talking with the groom's family to realize that his workers were sitting on the lower levels of the wedding hall, starving, as every wealthy person in the room feasted until they were sick. Later that night, Harasaman lay next to his wife and whispered miserably to her. Our pathetic situation is my fault, he said, tears stinging his eyes even as he rubbed them away angrily. His wife pressed his other hand with hers as she tried to comfort him. Do not blame yourself for what fate has given us. You have tried so hard for us all, and we should rejoice to be no longer begging on the streets. See how far we have come, she said, in an attempt to cheer his spirits. But this did not help her a though he offered his wife a weak smile in gratitude. You are too good to me, my wife, but I must find a way to improve our lives. And I think I have an idea. It's risky, but if you trust me, it may work he added with a hopeful glance at his wife. She nodded, and he explained his plan as they lay together in the dark. The next day, Stuladatta was awakened by angry cries and shouts within his household. Hurrying out of his chamber, he found his new son-in-law angrily shouting at the guards of the house, while his wife twisted the edge of her aunt child nervously. What is going on? Why has my entire household gone mad? Stuladatta shouted, and servants ran here and there in distress. His son-in-law turned, and, paying his respects to his father-in-law, explained the situation to him. My most prized horse has been stolen from inside this very house. I must get him back. He is my father's, his son-in-law explained. Stuladatta saw how important this was for his new son, and clapped his hands loudly to get the attention of his servants. 
He was about to begin shouting orders when Harasaman's wife stepped forward. Her eyes downcast in respect as she held her armchair so that it covered her entire face. My lord, if I may speak, I may be able to help, she murmured, just loud enough for Stiladatta to hear. He motioned for her to continue. My husband is a wise man, adept in astrology and the magical sciences. He will be able to locate your horse if you summon him now, she explained, before falling silent. The king was shocked to hear this, but instantly called for Harusaman, who came quickly, paid his respects, and waited. Harusaman, your wife claims that you are a wise man with knowledge of the mystic arts. My son-in-law's horse has been stolen. Can you locate it? Slavidatis asked. Harasaman paused before speaking. My lord, I mean no disrespect, but yesterday my family and I starved while you, your family, and your son-in-law feasted happily together. Food which was left over was thrown to the dogs, while we went to our beds with empty bellies. This despite our many months of hard work in your household. But now, when you are in need of my help to find a horse, you summon me without a thought. Harasaman spoke softly, yet everyone in the room was fixed upon his words. His tone was not accusatory, yet somehow, still the data felt guilt strike through his heart with such force that his hands shook. Harasaman, my loyal attendant, I can only ask you to forgive me. I acted wrongly, but I now ask you to look past my mistakes and think of my child and her good husband. This horse is precious to them, and you will have my eternal gratitude if you were to find it. The kings added sincerely. Harasaman was silent for some moments, but then nodded and smiled. It would be my honor, my lord. I'll need some ash and something associated with the horse, he requested. A servant ran to fetch some ash, while the son-in-law ordered for his horse's saddle to be brought. Once all was ready, Harasaman sat cross-legged on the floor, his wife sitting beside him, holding the bowl of ash. He sprinkled some of the ash on the saddle first, humming some words beneath his breath before pouring ash onto the floor and moving it about. Everyone leaned a little closer, curious as to his methods. The king's eyes widened as he realized that the ash had formed a crude map of the area, with symbols he did not recognize interspersed. Harasaman then examined the saddle closely, running his fingers across the material before exclaiming happily, Daha! He plucked a hair from the material, and with another string of foreign words, threw the hair high into the air. Everyone gasped and tilted their heads, watching enraptured as the hair drifted slowly down. The hair wavered slightly before moving quite suddenly to the left and settling down on the map of ash. Harasaman pointed at the hair. There, there is your horse, my lord. He has been tied up near the boundary line in the south quarters. But you must be quick, for the thieves will be back by midnight to steal them away forever. So the king immediately ordered some men to do as Harasaman said, and when they swiftly brought the horse back, he praised and praised Harasaman until he could no longer find more words to do so, pulling him instead into a brotherly embrace. Soon Harasaman found himself in new quarters with many comforts, his wife and children as well fed as he had hoped for, and his sons looked after prized horses. His wife praised him as well for his trickery, for the entire situation with the theft of the horse had been part of this scheme all along. Harasaman had stolen the horse himself and taken it to the south boundary where he had tied it up. Meanwhile, his wife had prepared to speak to the king as soon as word of the stolen horse had reached him. Then, Harasaman, with surprising wit and intelligence, made up the ritual to find the horse. He had, however, almost overdone it with the horse hair, which would have landed on completely the wrong place on the map, had his wise wife not subtly blown air towards it, which carried it to the correct location. For this, Harasaman could not thank her enough, and fed her many sweet delicacies by hand, pausing only to press kisses to her forehead, which made her blush sweetly. At last... Harasaman was content. Until one day, some weeks later, King Stoludata called him in and told him of an extremely urgent matter. 
Someone had been stealing from his house, and had already made off with much gold and jewels. He needed Harasaman's magic, but Harasaman felt his heart drop into his stomach. How was he to trick his way out of this? He asked the king to give him until the next day to find the thief, and so Stuladatta ordered his men to allow Harasaman into his own private chamber, and to lock the doors, so that the wise man would not be troubled by anything, while he sought counsel from the stars themselves. Harasaman could not protest without arousing suspicions, so he soon found himself locked away in a grand chamber, without his wise wife this time, to help him out of his predicament. For many, many hours Harasaman sat there, and racked his brain for some sort of plan, but nothing came to him. Despairing, Harasaman spoke aloud, miserably addressing his own tongue. Oh, wicked Jiva, why were you born to be so greedy? Because of your actions, your entire family shall suffer. But Harasaman did not know that his words had been heard by another. Early on, while the king had been explaining the theft to him, a servant by the name of Jiva had been listening outside of the door, for it was she, with the help of her brother, who had been stealing the treasure from the house. Panicking, she had crept to the chamber in which Harasaman sat, and listened outside the door, in the hope that he would offer some clues to her, and she could relay them to her brother. But now, when she heard Harasaman addressing his own tongue, she felt panic and despair grip her, as she thought that he was addressing her. In great distress, Jiva managed to unlock the chamber door, and flung herself to his feet. Oh, great sage, I do not know what magic you possess, but I know that it is better for me to come to you now instead of suffering from your powers later. Please, do not hurt my family. My brother is all I have. I know you said that my entire family will suffer, but please listen. I have hidden the treasure in the garden behind the house, just beneath the pomegranate tree. If you allow my brother and I to leave without a single piece of that gold, you can take some of the gold and return the rest to the king. She gasped out, still kneeling low on the floor. Had someone stared in shock at the girl, he did not know which god was smiling down at him, but he whispered a quick prayer to those whom he worshipped daily. Planting a wise smile on his face, he consented to the girl's plan, and, receiving a sack of gold with glee, watched as she ran out of the chamber in terror. Harasaman settled in for the night, a small smile lingering on his face. By the next morning, Harasaman went to the king and explained that, through many intense and tiring rituals, he had established that the treasure had been hidden under the pomegranate tree. As they rushed to the tree and found the treasure, Harasaman exclaimed that the thieves must have heard them coming, and ran away with a small amount of gold. The king was overjoyed, and once again embraced Harasaman, gripping his arms with joy. He gave many villages to him as a reward, and once again promoted him, this time to personal adviser. His wife was adorned with jewellery, and his sons were sent to study with the king's own sons. Harasavan was content once more. But still the daughter's head minister, a tall, thin man named Devajanan, had been watching Harasavan for some time, and had grown suspicious of his supposed magic. He began to whisper doubts into still the ears about his prized sage, and soon the king reluctantly grew suspicious. He decided to present Harasavan with a test a test which would be impossible to solve without great magic. He came to Harasaman one day, carrying a covered pitcher, in which he himself had placed a small frog. My dear Harasaman, if you can correctly tell me what is within this pitcher, I will make you the wealthiest, most powerful man in the city, aside from myself and my sons, of course, the king said, placing the pitcher into Harasaman's shaking hands. The pretend sage felt the life leave his chest as despair racked his body. His trickery had finally caught up. He would be found out as an impostor and thrown to the dogs. His wife would be placed on the streets so anyone could harm her, and his sons. He did not even want to think of their fates. His wife stood nearby, her face inscrutable, but how to alone saw terror in her eyes. As he stood there for what seemed like hours, how to found his mind wandering to his late father, who would often affectionately call him Froggy, because he would frequently jump around his parents like a small frog. In his great despair, Harasaman addressed himself by his father's pet name for him. Oh, froggy, this pitcher has brought about your swift doom. 
and you will soon lie in eternal darkness. Everyone around gasped as they heard his words, and the king shouted out with happiness. Devaj Nanin stood behind in shock, his mouth slightly open. Tuladatta clapped his hands with joy and pulled the stunned Hadassaman into an embrace. I knew you were my loyal sage. You will never have to worry again about food or money, my good friend, for you have shown me that you studied the magical arts. And so Harasaban was appointed as divine minister in the household, and was given much gold, property, and anything he asked for. His wife stood proudly by, as he advised Tuladatta on all matters, and his sons were educated to the highest level. Finally, Harasaman truly was content, and would often find himself whispering a few prayers to his friend Froggy, who saved his life on that fateful day. It was such a lovely tale to tell. Funny, sad, tense at times, but always enjoyable. What fortune had a salmon had, especially when it came to Jiva the thief and Jiva his tongue. Once again, I've written this tale in my own style. My main original source for this chapter is a story called Had a Salmon by Joseph Jacobs, which was written in 1892. You can hear a little more about Jacobs in chapter 1. I added and changed a few things, such as Had a Salmon's wife. I fleshed out her character and gave her a description, and greatly elaborated the ritual scene and Hannah Salmon's part in that. As for chapter one, I used some authentic words. In this case, I described Stiladata's daughter as fidgeting anxiously with her anchor, and Hannah Salmon's wife as wearing the anchor so that it covers the entire face. The anchor is the loose end of a sari, a traditional woman's garment from the Indian subcontinent, which is often pulled up and over a woman's face to indicate that she is married. Before we end, I have a lovely promo from Happily Ever Haunted Podcast. Hey Milton, what's your favorite cryptid? That's easy, Bailey. It's a Mothman. It just shows up, warns you of danger, and then just leaves. It's literally me at any party. What about you? Mine would have to be Bigfoot. She's a world traveler, and much like me during quarantine, she's real hairy. If you love all things strange and obscure, then you will love the Happily Ever Haunted Podcast. My wife, Bailey... And my husband, Milton, cover all things paranormal and beyond in a fun and entertaining way. You can find our podcast on your favorite podcast app. And remember, those that haunt together, stay together. And that brings us to the end of Chapter 2 of the Book of Fables. I sincerely hope that you have enjoyed this tale, and that you join me once more for Chapter 3. If you like what you hear, please take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you can leave reviews, and subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use. Remember to use the form on my website, or DM me your name to say that you were subscribed or listened, and your name will soon appear in the Cave of Wonders on my website. Follow on Twitter and Instagram at AsianTapestry1, and email me at theasiantapestrypod at gmail.com. This podcast is a proud member of the Straight Up Strange Network, and please check us out via the link in the show notes. Intro music was Jalandar by Kevin MacLeod, and outro music is Raga, Dance of Music by Akash Gandhi. Further details, including license information, may be found in the show notes. I have been your host, the Shira Papa, and you've been listening to The Asian Tapestry. Join me next time for Chapter 3 of The Book of Fables. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one 
at straightupstrange.com.